Good evening, colleagues, uh, and welcome to our first uh, Popia Healthcare Professional Awareness uh, webinar. Um, this is certainly a very topical and very popular topic. When I was last updated on the numbers, we had close to a thousand attendees uh, registered for this first session. So uh, thank you for your attendance and thank you for your interest. Uh, I'm Morris Goodman. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Discovery Health. And it's my distinct privilege and uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to this first uh, Poppia Brief webinar series update. I think as you probably know by now that with effect from the 1st of July, 2021, information sharing between healthcare professionals and uh, between healthcare professionals and funders must comply with the Act. Uh, as the information regulator can uh, then issue penalties for, for non-compliance. So in order to assist you to comply fully with the Act, tonight is the first session, as I say, of this uh, popular webinar series, and we'll be facilitating a number of these uh, over the next few weeks to support you as health professionals uh, as we get closer to the end of this 12-month uh, grace period from the 1st of July. Uh, ready to help uh, ensure that you and we are all compliant uh, with this Poppy Act in its entirety. Uh, I'm very pleased to inform you that this webinar is also CPD accredited for one health law point. Uh, certificates do take about a week uh, to, until they reach you. And if you have any queries in this regard, you can send those queries to our email address at cpd at discovery.coza. And in addition, the webinar will be available to you uh, in the webinar section of our COVID-19 hub for healthcare professionals. Uh, just before I hand over to Larry Borovitz, who uh, will present uh, this evening, um, uh, just a few house rules. Larry will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, and leaving us with about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. And with respect for your busy schedules, we will stick strictly uh, to time. So we will have you out of here by 7.30. Uh, we encourage questions. So please do ask those during the course of Larry's talk in the Q&A section. Uh, we've seen in previous webinar series that uh, we've held that um, we do get questions coming in in high volumes, and so we will do our best to get through uh, as many of them as possible. Um, and where possible or necessary, uh, we may well theme the questions and let, rather respond to them thematically rather than question by question. Um, but please do limit your, your questions uh, to the topic for this evening, which obviously is, is the Poppy Act. Um, at the end of the session, we have a short poll that uh, pops up uh, and we would ask you to, to respond uh, to that poll just to make sure that we continually improve on these sessions going forward. Um, so just by way of a, of a brief in introduction, uh, as I said, the, this webinar will be led by Larry Borovitz, who's a homegrown boy. He hails from Johannesburg. Uh, and he has uh, a few university degrees in information systems and is a certified Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. So we all better be careful how we speak to him. Uh, Larry joined Discovery many years ago in 2003 and he currently heads up our Service Lab Operations Management, uh, which is a department responsible for governance programs and enabling process and service optimization uh, through measuring and monitoring key service metrics at Discovery. Uh, he's the Deputy Information Officer designate for Discovery Health and has been responsible for our organization's quality management system uh, and treating customers fairly programs amongst uh, a number of other things. Uh, prior to joining Discovery, Larry gained a wide array of management systems and consulting experience through the positions he filled in various capacities at consulting firms and at, at some of South Africa's leading technology companies. So with that a brief background, 
it gives me great pleasure to hand over to uh, hand you over to Larry for the next 35 to 40 minutes. Enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Morris, and a warm welcome to everyone to this talk on poppy or papaya. So maybe I'll just uh, talk about the different terminologies which we refer to when we talk about poppy. So poppy stands for protection of person information, and poppia or papaya uh, we use to refer to the act which has been um, enacted to protect personal information within the country. So what is the status of the Poppy Act? You've probably heard Poppy mentioned over the last eight years numerous times. And the reason for that is because from what you can see on the slide, the Act was originally formally enacted into law by then President Zuma in November 2013. And it then took a number of steps to get to the point where we will be on July 20, um, 1st of July this year, where the Act will be fully effective and enforceable. So one of the steps required was the appointment of an information regulator. The president appointed the information regulator who is Pazi Nklakula. Um, and once she was appointed, she then would then draft regulations which she then published for public comment as well. She then had to get feedback on those regulations. So it's quite a process in terms of the act being originally enacted to the point where the regulator is appointed and then has drafted her regulations where we can then um, ensure that the act is enforceable. Quite, I think, to everybody's surprise on the first of our last year, um, President Ramaphosa actually um, promulgated that almost all sections of the Act would come into effect within a 12 month window, where we'd all then have to be fully compliant with the Act. So over the last number of months, and until this year, on the 1st of July, um, this feverish activity taking place within Discovery and many organizations in the country to ensure that when the 1st of July does come, we'll be fully ready um, for the Act, when the regulator is then gonna start monitoring how we are adhering to the regulations. So who are the poppy or papaya role players? So the first person is the information regulator. And then there are what we call information officers. So the head of a private or public body is the default information officer. That person can then appoint anybody in the organization to be the information officer in his or her stead. And they can also appoint deputy information officers. So what we, for example, are doing discovery is we're appointing an information officer for the group, and then each subsidiary of discovery will then have a deputy information officer, <clears throat> which will be myself in the case of discovery health, and the different companies in the group will then have information officers. So in the case of practices, and I'm going to go into this in more detail, the head of a practice would be the default information officer, and that person can then appoint other people as information officers or deputy information officers to act on their behalf. The first concept to um, think about from a identifiable person or juristic entity is what we call the data subject. So the data subject could be an employee, a customer, a member, a patient. And that person or data subject would have a whole lot of information, which we call personal information about them. So that could be, for example, an ID number, an address, or a cell phone number. There is also special personal information or SPI. And SPI is information which needs to be protected to a great extent compared to standard personal information. So SPI would relate to children, anyone under the age of 18, one's religious beliefs, one's race, trade union membership, one's uh, health, one's sex life, biometrics, and other things like criminal offenses. So think of the data subject in essence as oneself, or in the case of a company or a um, trust, that would be a juristic person. Um, and those persons are also covered under the Poppy Act. Then we have what we call a responsible party. And this is any public or private body or person 
that determines the purpose of and means of processing of personal information. So in the case of the medical fraternity, a responsible party would be the healthcare practitioner. And the healthcare practitioner would have a number of activities that have to adhere to and uh, enforce, and that also be a defined scope in terms of what they would need to do as that responsible party. What you can see um, where it says conditions of lawful processing is that there are eight main conditions in the act which a responsible party needs to comply with to ensure that they are lawfully processing information which they're responsible for. What we've done in discovery and what we're gonna do in this presentation is not take you through these eight conditions in terms of a laundry list to kind of make a very boring presentation where you literally have to listen to um, how lawyers potentially would speak. So what we've done is we've taken these core concepts or conditions and built them into our own framework, which we're gonna share with you this evening. What you can also see is that in addition to the eight conditions, there's some extra conditions around things like direct marketing or automated decision-making. Then we have an operator. And the operator is any person or party that processes personal information for a responsible party in terms of a contract or mandate. So if we think of the medical fraternity, we would have a responsible party who would contract with a bureau who would then be their operator, would then work on the data that the healthcare practitioner would be responsible for. So just to summarize the slide, we can see there are three main role players in terms of the data subject who would pass on his or her data to a responsible party to look after and the responsible party can appoint an operator to then work with that data. Um, and they need to make sure from an operations point of view that they are protecting the data just as if they were the responsible party. And that's why one would put a contract in place between the responsible party and the operator. What I want to do now is take you through how the relationships exist in the world of the health practitioner from a papaya perspective. So we've put the slide together to try and show you the interrelationships between the different parties. So while it may look quite intimidating up front, um, I want to take you through the different role players and hopefully show you that at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be so confusing or so difficult to implement. So here we at the center, we have the healthcare practitioner. Then we would have the patient who would then be the data subject, who would then contract with or give consent to the healthcare practitioner to be the responsible party for their data. Then there are a number of operator relationships which the healthcare practitioner could also have. So for example, they could appoint a PMA or B2B provider to process their claims. That would then require a formal relationship in terms of the healthcare practitioner and the PMA or B2B with a PMA or B2B are operating in the context of an operator. Then we could also have bureaus where the healthcare practitioner would appoint formally the bureau to manage their accounts, for example. And we also have scenarios where we other have other third parties where let's take a dental lab, for example, where a patient has no direct relationship between, for example, let's take a dentist and a dental lab, the dentist would see the patient, would maybe need to um, make a prosthesis for the patient. They would then hand over information to the dental lab, which be regarded as SPI or special person information um, because it would probably be very clinical. Um, and then what we're saying here is that the healthcare practitioner should then formally engage with the dental lab or the other third party in terms of an operator type of relationship with a formal contract. So what does this mean in terms of the healthcare practitioner and discovery? So let's have a look here. If we look at the patient, the patient could also be a member of a medical scheme. So the member then would contract with the medical scheme as a responsible party. So the, the member say to the medical schemes, you are responsible for the data, which I'm giving you and I'm giving you consent to manage that data. Medical schemes like Discovery Health Medical Scheme would then appoint an operator, which in our case would be Discovery Health, which would be the administrator and the managed care provider, 
where we would then operate on behalf of the medical scheme, which is then the responsible party for the member. So what you can see from the dotted lines is that there's no formal relationship in terms of a responsible party or a um, operate relationship between the healthcare practitioners and Discovery Health. So let's look at how this would work. So let's say, for example, a healthcare practitioner wants to send an email to Discovery about a certain patient requesting specific care for that patient. What would then happen is the healthcare practitioner would then pass on that information and share that with the patient consent with Discovery Health. Discovery Health would then review that particular request and would then send information back to the healthcare practitioner. The healthcare practitioners uh, would also, as I said earlier on, could appoint bureaus and they could also request Discovery to send their statements, for example, to the bureaus, where again, Discovery would be seen as information sharer to the bureaus without having a formal relationship in terms of a responsible party or operator relationship. And I think the key thing here is that people often see Papaya as it's going to stop people sharing data. And we're going to kind of get to a point where everybody's going to be very scared to share data with one another. And I think what's important to recognize is that, yes, there are scenarios where you do need to engage as a responsible party and as an operator. But within the country, there'll be a lot of data sharing happening between various parties where you don't need to have a formal contract. So that really is a summary of the interrelationships between the different parties. Um, so I'm gonna to go to the next slide and really explain how we as Discovery have looked at our privacy framework. What you can see in the middle over here where it says principle are all the different elements of the act, which what we've done, we've said rather than um, talk legal jargon or in legalese, let's rather incorporate those principles into a framework, which is far simpler to understand. So what we did, we said, let's think about a building where here we've got the act itself as the foundation. Then we have four pillars, which run across the model or the framework. And then we have four different parts of the life cycle of um, the data acquisition and management process. So if you think what one does first, one acquires data, one then uses it, one then shares it and then one maintains and then potentially disposes of data. So if we think of these four pillars supported by these beams across as well as the foundation, we will then get our framework. What you can see on the right hand side is that a key element of Papaya is the ability to lodge a complaint um, and then where there may be a breach as well, where you can manage incidences formally. So we have that in our framework, both in terms of the beams across as well as the, um, the different um, pillars. So another way to look at it is that the pillars can be seen as the life cycle process. The principles are embedded in these different pillars. And then we also have what we call these cross life cycle considerations or these beams, which then run across the different pillars or the life cycle of the data. So what I'm gonna take you through now is how we've taken our framework and how it can be applied in the world of um, the healthcare practitioner. So we're gonna look at definitions, nominated individuals and parties, then look at storage and security in terms of uh, two of the four beams, and then look at these uh, different pillars in terms of acquisition, use, sharing and maintaining of data. The one point I wanted to make was that while there is a legal imperative to comply with the law or the act, what's also important is to think about the spirit of the law. And the law has been structured in such a way that it's principles based. Um, and what it's trying to do is encourage people to support the right to privacy, really because it's the right thing to do. Because as citizens, whether we are juristic or natural persons, we believe that our data should be protected and should not be um, abused or taken um, out of context in terms of where we've originally um, supplied our data. So I think what's, what's really um, gonna drive the long-term su success of Papaya is if people actually respect the spirit of the law, as well as understanding obviously that one needs to comply with the law in terms of the letter of the law. 
So that is how we're approaching papaya and turning within discovery, saying that we know that's the right thing to do to protect our stakeholders' information, and that's what you want to do. Um, and we're using the law or the Papaya Act as a foundation on which to um, really drive the deployment of papaya into the business. So as I said earlier on, by default, the head of a private body or a practice would be the information officer. Um, and this default information officer can appoint another individual as the nominated information officer for the organization. So you then can have an information officer as well as additional deputy information officers um, to support privacy within the organization. And one is allowed more than one additional, um, more than one deputy information officer, but one would only have one information officer appointed potentially by the default information officer. In terms of breaches, what can happen is where there are cases of privacy complaints that are lodged with the regulator, uh, the regulator could prosecute and the court could in, be entitled, would be entitled to award damages for monetary and non-monetary loss, aggravated damages, interest and legal fees. The information officer, the head of the practice could be jailed for up to 10 years and fines of up to 10 million Rand could be awarded. So while we're not saying this to scare you, I think what um, the law is trying to say is that the deployment of papaya is going to be taken very seriously with the regulator overseeing how the law is being enforced. And if there are major breaches, there could be major repercussions for the heads of organizations in terms of jail time as well as fines that could be awarded. The one piece of good news is that up until um, June of this year, the regulator is not issuing any fines, but we do expect that from 1 July, she will start monitoring adherence to the act and look um, for adherence and for non-compliance and could potentially issue fines um, to non-compliant organizations. In terms of storage and security, the first concept we want to discuss is that we need to make sure that the integrity and confidentiality of information is secured. So in order to do this, um, an example would be physical access to files, where in a practice, you may have a cupboard uh, full of files or a big um, cabinet where what needs to make what needs to happen is that access to those files needs to be managed and monitored and that it needs to be decided within the practice who has access to those files and um, in terms of when they're taken out when they're returned and good good uh, governance needs to be put in place in terms of how those ex how those files are actually managed another element of this is where information is being left on a desk about a patient which is visible to another patient. So it could be that within the doctor's rooms, the doctor sitting with a pathology report, which is on his or her desk, and then another patient who may know that particular pa um, patient whose results on the desk would be then be visible to that particular patient. Or it could be that a receptionist has got a number of files open and patients can see information about other patients. So what needs to happen here is that there needs to be what we call a clean desk policy where information is kept private in the sense that it's not shared and not visible to any other patients who are visiting or being tended to in a practice. In terms of physical records, these must be disposed of professionally. So these need to be shredded. So you can't take physical records or old records and just dump them in a bin. One needs to make sure that they're shredded and that they're not readable um, after they've been disposed of. And the third element around security is that one needs computer systems which have the necessary security or cyber security controls in place. And what we've seen over the years is that when there's any kind of breach in the computer system, this typically gets the most amount of press. And one of the reasons for this is that when there's a computer breach, it's often that hundreds of thousands potentially records could be compromised. And obviously that would make, um, make the press and would make um, the uh, good media. So, What's more important is to say, like, what are you doing around your computer system to make sure that you are protecting information which you're responsible for as a responsible party? So one needs to think of things like what firewalls one has in place, um, one's internet gateways, um, one's end user computers. Do they have, um, for example, McAfee um, on, it, on them in terms of security? Um, and just make sure that your computer systems are properly controlled and that you have uh, software in place to limit any kind of access to information which would be fraudulent. 
In terms of acquisition of information, the first concept, concept I'm going to talk to around this is this concept we call minimality. So what minimality is, is this idea that one needs to acquire the minimum amount of information necessary in order to act um, in the role that one has been appointed. So if we take, for example, a doctor, a patient comes to a doctor and would say, I want to register with this practice. Um, I want the doctor to treat me. If we think about it, the doctor would need to know certain information from an administrative point of view, like um, a medical aid number or an address or a telephone number, as well as some clinical information. But if one thinks of an income, the question of income, minimality would say that if the doctor does not need to know the income of the patient in order to treat them, they should not be requesting that information. So what one needs to do is look at your patient registration forms and say, what information are you requesting from your prospective patients when they come to register? And have you ensured that only information which is necessary from a clinical as well as from an administrative perspective um, have been requested? And if there are any additional fields, for example, information you're requesting, which are not necessary, um, then you need to consider this uh, concept of minimality and remove those from your patient registration forms. The next element is this uh, concept of a privacy statement. And this is a very important document or statement which um, organizations need to have. So what a privacy statement is in essence, is it's a document which is published potentially um, on a, your website, could be printed and on, put on a wall in a practice, but it really is the document that encapsulates how the practice looks at privacy. And what it's intended to do is to protect the right of the patient as well as the right of the practice in terms of um, the Papaya Act. So what we've done in discovery, um, we've created a template, which we're happy to share with the various practices um, where what we've done is we've thought through the different elements of what one would need to consider in a privacy statement. Um, and we're happy to share this either through the different um, field force representatives or through different panels, um, which the likes of Morris uh, and Darren Swaden engage with. Um, so we will share the privacy statement as requested. One of the key elements of these privacy statements is this whole concept of, of purpose. Um, so what one needs to state in your privacy statement is why you're collecting information. So you need to be specific um, and explicit about why you want information and what you intend to do with it. Um, and the data subjects need to understand this in terms of what it means when they supply data or provide information to the practice. What we would suggest is that you take your privacy statement um, and parts of that should then be combined into your patient registration form. Um, because in essence, what you want when someone signs your patient registration form is in essence, they are, and I'll come to that point now, consenting to what you have requested in terms of your right as a practice, in terms of how you're going to manage privacy, as well as the rights of the patient in terms of their privacy. In terms of the concept of consent, this is very important. Um, because what the law is trying to do is make sure that when someone hands over the information, they are fully aware that the information is being provided to a responsible party, what the responsible party intends to do with it, and how it's going to be shared with other operators. So what needs to happen is that a patient, in um, the case of a practice, who then be the data subject, would then have to provide consent that they, in essence, agree to the different parts of the privacy statement and sharing information with other third parties. In the case of families, a nice example would be when a, for example, a, let's say um, a spouse comes to the practice for the first time and it's a family practice and it could be the spouse, um, let's say her husband and three children. So the question which you need to consider in terms of your privacy statement would be what would happen if the spouse signs the patient registration form, consents to joining the practice as a family, um, the spouse would then be a um, responsible party, or sorry, would then be the, um, would then sign on behalf of the children, and they could also sign potentially on behalf of um, the other spouse. What you need to then discuss with the uh, first spouse, in essence, is discuss with them to say that when they're signing the forms, that they're signing on behalf of the family and not only on behalf of themselves. Um, if, for example, a spouse would have a problem with that, 
then they would only sign on behalf of themselves and potentially the children. And the second spouse would then have to sign a separate form or an addendum to that patient registration form. What can also happen is when there's individuals without capacity, so for example, someone with dementia, um, you then have a person who would then come in and um, they would have then consent to sign on behalf of that individual if they do not have capacity to operate um, in their own capacity. In terms of using data, so one of the key tenets of Papaya is this concept of original purpose, and it's um, supported by this other concept of further processing limitation. So very simply, what these terms mean is that when you are um, given information as a responsible party, you can only use it for the original intent that it was given. And that in essence would be the original purpose. And the second element around this is that you cannot use this information for further processing. In other words, there's a limit on what you can do in terms of further processing this information. So if you think about it from a practice perspective, if a practice is approached by a marketing company and they say they'd like to buy data from the practice, um, the practice cannot sell data without getting the patient's consent. So when a patient joins the practice and they read through the privacy statement, they would hopefully get a very good idea of what the practice intends to do with that information. Um, but the act is really trying to discourage information being shared when it's not consented to by data subjects. The second element of use is around information quality. And this is really trying to make sure that practices keep the information quality um, up to date in terms of their patients. So it's not a one-way street where the onus is only on the practice to keep information up to date. It's also really the uh, onus on the, on the uh, patients to also update the practice about any changes to the information. And what's important is that uh, data subjects need to understand what would happen if they don't update the information. So if, for example, a, a, a patient goes in for a procedure and you need to contact the next of kin and the next of kin details are not up to date, it could actually impact the ability to communicate with the next of kin when there's a critical decision to be made. So that what Papa is trying to do is to say on both the data subject and the responsible party side is that the data subjects need to think about keeping the information up to date with the responsible parties um, with whom they engage. And when, data sub when responsible parties are given new information, they need to have the processes in place that information is updated and kept current and accurate. Then the third element of use here is what we call openness. Um, and there's two sub points around this. The first is that all processing operations on patient data must be stored and available. So what this is really saying is that any information, where, whether it be clinical or administrative, which is stored um, about a certain patient, needs to be stored securely and available if a patient wants to see it. Um, and the second element is that patients need to understand consequences of not providing updated information. And that would relate to the point I made earlier on about, for example, not um, keeping information up to date. The other element around openness relates to um, something which is in the PIA Act. So PIA stands for Promotion of Access to Information Act. Um, and in essence, POPI or PAPIA and PIA are, let's call them sister acts. So it sounds a bit confusing, but PIA is intended to enable anyone in the country to say to any organization that has their data that they want to see it and they want to see what the, that particular organization has on record about them. So if we think of a practice, a patient come to a doctor to say, I want to see all the information you have about me that you've stored over the years. Where Poppy comes in, from a conceptual point of view is to say, um, yes, there's the access to information, but there's also the protection of information. So what you run from a poppy perspective is that the practice would do everything in their power to protect information in terms of other people having access to that information. But from a PIA perspective, what it's about is saying that we need to be open in terms of responsible parties to data subjects coming to those practices or to those responsible parties and requesting the information. So in other words, it's saying that there needs to be transparency around information that's stored um, 
and kept by responsible parties. In terms of sharing and communicating information, the first point I want to touch on is third party contracts. So as you saw earlier on in that slide, which described the relationships between the various parties in the papaya world for health practitioners, um, there are these third party contracts which need to be signed. What we're suggesting uh, practices do is that they review their third party contracts and make sure that they include papaya related clauses, just to ensure that any contract which has been in place for a number of years is up to date with papaya related uh, clauses and that in the event of there being any issues between the responsible party and these third parties who in essence will be operating as operators, um, there's coverage and there's an understanding of what res the responsibilities are of both parties. So that in essence would mean going through all your contracts, making sure they're up to date um, and then adding any poppy clauses as addenda or potentially um, in terms of re-signing a contract from scratch. The second element of sharing and communicating is communicating externally. And this is quite a big um, challenge, especially in the case of discovery, where we're sending out literally millions of communications to members, doctors, employers, brokers on a daily basis. So what one needs up front is you need to have a policy and you need to have procedures in place which limit information being shared with unintended parties. So as an example, one can use security features in email applications like Outlook, one can encrypt documents which are um, in the PDF format, or one can create a secure inbox. So what Discovery plans are doing for healthcare practitioners is creating these secure inboxes. So what will happen is that communication which is sent to a um, healthcare practitioner would be available in the secure inbox. And what will happen over time is that all the communications which relate to that practice would then be accessible in that secure inbox. Um, so that if you're looking for a certain communication, it would be easy to find. We would also create functionality that you can then sort on date or other fields as well. What secure inboxes um, do is they give one the ability to also make sure that the information is secured. So to get it to a secure inbox, one would have to log into, um, in the case of a healthcare practitioner, the HP zone, as an example, where they would then go in and then access their secure inbox. What we're also looking at doing is encrypting PDF documents. So this would be where we would use a certain key um, where what would happen is the mail would then be sent to the healthcare practitioner with the encrypted PDF. And in order for them to open it, they would then have to put in a key um, to, in essence, unlock the particular document. So what we're suggesting again for healthcare practitioners is that you look at the communication um, technology that you're using, how you're sending out different communications, um, and just make sure that you've considered um, that the information that's being sent can be secured. Because what you don't want to happen, for example, is have a private um, document, let's say about a pathology result sent by email to the wrong party, where you use the wrong email address and then the mail goes to the wrong party and then the person can then actually lodge a complaint to the regulator to say that they've been receiving unencrypted, easily accessible information um, from a certain doctor. The third element around um, sharing is transferring of information outside of South Africa. So um, what the Act is trying to do is limit sharing information outside the borders of the country. But there is a recognition that medical practitioners would have quite a bit of discretion um, in terms of sharing information. So if, for example, one has a patient who's overseas and they have a heart attack and there's a call to the doctor to say like what's medicines or is this patient on um, it would be obvious that the healthcare practitioner could share that information with a doctor overseas or with a hospital in another country so the act is concerned about transferring of information outside the borders um, but there's obviously scenarios where it would be necessary in terms of maintaining information the first element is around deleting or de-identifying um, information so a patient, in the case of um, a practice, can come to the practice and say to the doctor, I haven't been here for a certain period of time and I want you to, to delete my information and there should be no ways that I can be, uh, I can be identified in the information which you have on record. So what the regulator has done is they've created special forms um, where you fill these out and then what will then transpire is that 
the practice would then have to find a way to delete that information or de-identify the information um, of that data subject. Related to this would be the question of retention policies, which really would be the time frame to keep patient data. So what we have seen that uh, the HBCSA um, in their guidelines for good practice um, in the healthcare professions have created a guidelines for keeping patient records. Um, and what they've suggested is a period of six years from the time that the information has become dormant. A practice can use that or, or decide if that policy suits them, or they can decide that they need either a shorter period or longer period, as long as they can justify why they need to keep that information. So it's really about saying, if a patient um, is active, you'd obviously wanna keep the information on record because you never quite know when you wanna refer back to it. But there does come a point where information <clears throat> um, for uh, patients who've left a practice is no longer relevant. Um, and in your policy, in your privacy statement, you could also state how long you wish to retain information of your previous patients for, and um, when you want to um, keep them, why you want to keep them for that uh, length of time. Then the last element around this is what we call structured and unstructured data de-identification. So when we think of data, we often think of data in a database, for example, name, address, ID number, cell phone number, where you'd have that structured data. But organizations have a lot of unstructured data, which they keep on record. So that could be information kept in emails, information kept on file servers, uh, information in files, doctor's notes. Um, and what can happen is when a status subject comes to practice and says, I want you to please de-identify me or delete my information, um, one needs to be able to find that information in terms of the unstructured data. So we recognize that this is quite a tall order. Um, we call this in discovery, data discovery, in terms of the term that's used more generally in, in the, the industry, which is the ability to discover data on both a structured and unstructured uh, basis. So what one needs to start thinking about is how you're gonna de-identify and find um, unstructured data as well as structured data in the event that you're requested to remove this data from your records. So what tools is Discovery creating to support health professionals in terms of Papaya? So there's three systems I'd like to talk to today. <clears throat> the first is Connected Care, which some doctors may have been exposed to, but this is a secure enhanced health uh, practitioner system where we are enabling both, <coughs> excuse me, digital as well as physical consultations. So this is really kind of this whole world of connecting with your doctor virtually or physically um, and making sure that you can do that in a secure way. Then Health ID, where there's three elements I want to touch on. The first is a secure login to access patient information then the ability to get consent from data subjects for specific practitioners, and also the storage of patient records in a clinical data repository. So Health ID is a great tool to use um, in terms of different elements of Papaya, which is secure login, consent, and secure patient records, which are easily accessible, and if necessary, it would be easy to then de-identify. And the third system is um, the provider zone, where a doctor or their uh, practice support staff can log in um, and act access practice as well as patient information. And we hope that um, many of you are using these tools and if not, that you can start using them uh, to greater effect. So in terms of what I've been saying, it may sound very overwhelming um, and very difficult to actually deploy. But what we've done is uh, we've created a 10 point checklist to assist with papyri readiness. And we believe that if uh, using a medical term, if you had to dissect the act, um, these would be the 10 things which you can start with in terms of assisting you to be ready for papaya. So I'm gonna just recap uh, or talk to these 10, which in essence is a recap to some of the um, information which I've shared a bit earlier. So the first is the information officer identification and appointment. Um, so this would be the, um, decision by the practice to either say the head of the practice will have the role of the information officer, or they're going to then delegate to another formally appointed person to be their information officer and potentially employ uh, or deploy other deputy information officers. What we typically find um, the regulator suggesting is that the information officer needs to be someone who is familiar with 
the business and does, doesn't necessarily need to be a new role. So you can appoint someone already in the practice who's familiar with the way the practice runs and operates. Um, and that person can then be appointed as the IO information officer or as a DIO or um, you can have multiple, as I said, um, deputy information officers. What is actually happening now in terms of process is that we're expecting the information regulator to open up her website from the beginning of May to start capturing information officers and deputy information officers that have been appointed for the various bodies across the country. So what we suggest that over the next few weeks, um, you consider who your information officer would be. And if you want to appoint someone, um, if you're the head of the practice in your stead, and if you need any DROs. The second point of the checklist is access to information. So this is ensuring that all physical access to information like patient files is secured and accessed by designated staff only, and that your computer systems have security controls in place to ensure access is only by authorized individuals. From a privacy statement perspective, practices should create their own privacy statements, which should include papaya clauses and policies. And what we're proposing is that once this has been drafted, you can send this to your existing patients so that they're aware of the practices privacy statement. In terms of new patients, patient registration forms will be relevant. So here, what we're proposing is that you update your patient registration form to include relevant clauses from your privacy statement, including consent, um, and only include information which is required at a minimum to process patient information, which is based on that concept of minimality, which I spoke to earlier. In terms of information quality, we're also suggesting that patients be requested to provide current biographical and contact details, and that practices on receipt of those then update their records. Then from a retention policy perspective, we're proposing that a formal policy regarding how long patient records are kept is uh, decided and documented within the practice. Um, and that information which is older than the agreed period should be properly deleted and disposed of. Then from an accessibility point of view, one needs to make sure that information, whether it be physical or digital, related to patients is accessible and shareable within, um, the, the, for patients um, on request. Then in terms of your third party contracts, one should review your third party contracts and make sure that they include papaya clauses where it's relevant. From an external communication perspective, you should look at your policies and procedures that are in place um, and consider how you're gonna be communicating externally and how you're gonna limit any potential miscommunication coming from your practice. And last but not least would be training. And this would be where your staff will be trained on papaya and it doesn't have to be very technical. It could be on the basics. And some of the basics would be things like not sharing passwords or keeping tidy desks or the clean desk policy I spoke about earlier. So what we're saying is that if you do these 10 things, you in essence are complying um, to a large extent with the Act. There's many other elements of the Act which um, I haven't covered this evening because it would make the presentation too long and potentially too laborious to listen to. Um, but what we're saying is there's a couple of key points which you need to start considering between now certainly and, and June um, and uh, making sure that you consider the different elements in this checklist which will then get you on the road to being papaya compliant. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the formal presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and then hand over to Morris to um, who's curating the questions to then pose the questions. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Larry. Uh, that's uh, really informative. And uh, um, I think you covered a lot. And also, as you say, took a very dry, uh, rich legal document and kind of um, compressed it into to words that we can understand. So thank you for that. Um, there have been a number of questions that have come up in the Q&A, some of which your colleague uh, Peter has answered. Um, but I think I maybe do want to just pose them uh, for the forum. So perhaps your Peter can address it for everybody. Uh, so there was one theme around kind of consent for related practices, radiology practices, for example. Um, you know, can they 
uh, request access to certain blood results that they might need in order to, to give an informed uh, opinion? Can they release results of the, um, of the scans, et cetera, perhaps to a secondary treating doctor um, where that hasn't been specifically uh, consented for um, on an administrative uh, level in terms of bureaus following up perhaps um, querying claim statements to funders. Um, I'm not sure if you and Peter can talk yeah, so about this. Peter, I'll, take, I'll take the question first, but just to introduce Peter van der Valt. Um, so Peter is the information officer designate for um, Discovery Limited. So as I said earlier on, Discovery is appointing an information officer and Peter is that individual. And then I'll be working closely with Peter as the Deputy Information Officer in Discovery Health. So, Morris, I think the answer to that question really lies in the privacy statement and what um, is written in there, where what should happen in the privacy statement and when, um, a, for example, a new registration form, when a patient joins in those privacy statements and registration forms, consent should be given that the practice is able to share information with other third parties like other healthcare practitioners. Um, or other parties like bureaus um, for information administrative purposes. So I think for me, it all starts in what is in the privacy statement and the patient registration form, which should include those clauses. And if those exist, then in essence, the patient would have the right to share that information with third parties, which would be practices, other practices or um, other administrators like bureaus. Peter, much if you want to add to that. Oh, thank you, Larry. Um... Yes, provided then, of course, that the, the patient hasn't withdrawn their consent. So remember, consent can always be withdrawn. And in our consent system, we do track that we, some patients may have withdrawn their consent. So we just need to make sure then that that is also covered, like you rightly said, Larry, in your privacy statement, of course. Uh, but if there is a blockage uh, when that request does go through, the consent on our side is just also then flagged appropriately to make sure that that consent is then provided to, to go through to the re relevant service provider as well. Good, thank you. And then just to confirm, Larry, so for a, say, maybe a referring type practice like a radiology or a pathology lab, I mean, they are then again, would that be covered by the consent statement in terms Correct. of what? So when someone goes to a radiologist, for instance, the radiology practice should make sure that their privacy statement says that they are able to share the results with um, another practice, which Correct. is kind of obvious because you're going to the radiologist that you were typically sent by a referring doctor. Um, but one needs to make sure that the R's are uh, dotted, the T's are crossed in terms of that the consent is granted by the patient in that the radiology or pathology um, to those radiology pathology practices. Good. Uh, again, uh, I think the specific, what if there's, you know, more than one treating clinician as often happens, you may have a, a few specialists involved and information might need to be provided to a, a treating clinician other than the one that questioned. But mm. I think you probably... Uh, yeah, so again, once it's in the privacy statement or that in your documents where you are granting consent, um, you can make it quite broad to say that information can be shared with any other healthcare practitioner that is deemed necessary in order to provide the necessary care for the patient or the data subject. Uh, Maurice, also keep in mind that, that if a patient should ask under PIA for a request for information, and you have shared that information with other third parties, you should also then disclose to whom you've shared that information to. The patient can ask for that type of uh, make that type of request as well, and it's within their full right to to make those requests as well. So, it would be obviously in good stead to make sure that you uh, keep record of where you have shared information to potential third parties as well. Good, thanks. Another theme that came up, Larry, that I think you did address as well is regarding specifically discovery, and I guess other. Uh, other funders, the, the various digital platforms that, that you referred to uh, in terms of their being uh, poppy compliant and uh, treating clinicians making use of those platforms to store information, to kind of share it uh, with us or with other funders um, and whether that uh, 
has been checked out in terms of uh, poppy compliance? Yeah, so um, again, you know, all those systems where there are passwords and logins that are required um, and in the case of like health ID, where there's the repository of information, all of those have obviously been checked out just in terms of making sure that everything's been done to put uh, digital as well as cyber security controls in place um, to limit um, access um, from anybody who should not have access. Um, and that's why that consent concept is so important um, in Health ID, where the patients are granting consent to the doctor and other doctors to view their information. So um, I'm comfortable to say that certainly from a um, technical point of view, um, we have done everything in our power to make sure that we are protecting the information um, of the practices when they sign up for our various tools. And there was a specific question specifically regarding the HPCSA, for example, that um, you know, from their perspective, uh, that all of this is uh, fine and signed off, I guess. Uh, um, you know, we've checked with all the, the relevant uh, authorities. Yeah, so the HPCSA have got their own suggestions and recommendations. As I said, for example, they say keep information for six years. Um, but if a certain practice feels that they want to deviate from the HPCSA, and it's more of a guide, um, then they, and they can justify it then I don't see any reason why they can't, um, can't do that, provided they can justify why they need to keep information potentially longer than what is regarded as, you could call it best practice in the medical fraternity. Okay, see, we've just got three minutes left and I did promise to get everyone out of here uh, promptly. Um, just a couple of questions about the practices themselves. Uh, there's a question whether practices have to uh, individually register with the regulator, uh, all, all they have to, uh, you know, register all individually with the regulator or just certify their compliance? So the way I read it, uh, Morris, is that if a person is let's say, a family practitioner and has his or her own practice, then they would have to register as uh, the information officer. In cases of group practices or corporates, um, then that would be one individual would then be the, in essence, call it the head of the practice or you could call a CEO or head doctor, who'd be the default information officer. And then the practice can then decide if they want the, that person to be the information officer or if um, they'd rather the, you know, the practice appoints other people to act in that role. And then they'd, they'd have to register on the, the website. Peter, I'm not sure if anything you want to add to that. Yep. Yep. Exactly, um, you've got it right there, Larry. So as a responsible party, you have to register with the regulator. Yeah. And the process is not, should not be that onerous. There are a couple of forms which kind of guide you through Correct. it. Um, and once it's done, then your records are with the regulator. Uh, and then, Peter, there was another question along those lines, which you did answer in the chat about the information officer needing to be, be the most uh, senior person. I think you did answer that that could be delegated. Is that correct? Correct. Correct, yes. So there is, there is by default, the information officer is, is the head of the organization, but obviously, like we said, uh, and as per the guidance note from the regulator, there is uh, room for delegation. And of course, not for accountability, but definitely for responsibilities. Good. Okay, colleagues, I think that is uh, just about time uh, to sign off. Um, just to remind you, and there was one of the questions as well. The, these are being recorded and they will be available um, on, on our website. So, uh, and as I say, there will be a number of other of these webinars as well. So for yourselves and uh, for your colleagues to, to attend. Um, also that we will be making available, uh, if you find it useful, uh, the 10 point checklist that uh, Larry mentioned. Uh, as well as a privacy uh, statement template, which you can then customize and uh, you know check with any person you need to check with and then uh, make use of that. So all that remains really then for me is to, to thank Larry and Peter and all the people in the background who really made this uh, webinar uh, possible. And thanks to all of you. Uh, your time is precious and uh, I do thank you uh, for attending.
Uh, the poll has popped up. Please, if you could just respond before you sign out, just to uh, help us improve this going forward. Um, and so thank you again for your attendance and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.